Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. I'm Bob Keefe from uh, Occidental College. Um, surely you don't need to come to Charleston, South Carolina, uh, and attend this conference to know that uh, wherever you are on the great chain of publishing being, from author to archive, that all the other links in the chain are abuzz with uh, opportunity and challenge these days. Our remit on this panel uh, is to discuss um, publishing as it looks today from the point of view of scholarly societies and the 300-year-old-plus tradition that so such societies bring with them to a variety of services and purposes for which their members band together. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our three panelists, uh, and Anthony will uh, moderate the question session again. Um, in order of speaking, I'd like to introduce uh, Brandon Nordine, Vice President for Marketing, Sales, and Digital Strategy at the American Chemical Society. Second will be Steve Wheatley, Vice President of the American Council of Learned Societies. And third, representing my own scholarly society, the Modern Language Association, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, who is the Director of Scholarly Communication, the first, I think, uh, Director of Scholarly Communication at MLA. So, Brandon? Thank you, as you heard, I'm Brandon Nordine. I'm the Vice President of Marketing, Sales, and Digital Strategy for the American Chemical Society's uh, publishing arm, ACS Publications. Um, we are now, obviously, on the threshold of a new era and paradigm in publishing. Uh, many details are unclear, and all markets are not going to move at similar pace. But I think the, uh, for, for societies in particular, uh, while there are obviously challenges in the transition, uh, the opportunities outweigh the difficulties. That, I think, is because the new information economy breaks a logjam in the marketplace and engages the research funder community directly. Um, and it has the opportunity to recapitalize the output of science and engineering fields and uh, uh, to uh, help assist the library budgets that have not kept pace with the growth in output. And again, I think the, the, the fundamental issue here is that um, we're in a boom economy for education, particularly STEM graduate education. We're a boom economy for um, uh, science funding, especially, again, when you look at this at a global scale, not just in the US. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the rise in output is significant. And no library's budget has kept pace uh, to, to uh, um, uh, deal with that. These are just some, some quick background numbers on ACS. And I look at those, and I especially look at the um, change between 2000 and 2010, when ACS, like many publishers, went through the big digital jump. Um, and I, I, I see you know, double to triple digit increases in published articles, in cited research, and in usage. And for all the challenges we have in the library community today, and all the discussions about pricing and um, who pays for what, I think we should also recognize that we've lived in a golden age of scholarly publishing, where more people have greater access to more scholarly information than ever, thanks largely to library-managed subscription uh, resources. The long phase shift that will occur, we believe, between subscription only and open access and the mixed article economy that is a result is due to the trans, uh, transition of OA from a relatively um, a uh, narrow concept talked about and implemented by a few across the universe of scholarly publishing to a, an activity practiced by many, largely due to funder mandates. Uh, one of our challenges today, though, is that there are buzzwords galore and that there are few consistently applied and understood standards. This is perhaps a good thing. Innovation requires a certain amount of flexibility. So I would urge that we encourage ex experimentation and curb litmus tests. Publishers, users, authors, and libraries are all in this together, and it's going to take us a while to sort this out. So what are the implications for societies, libraries, and the research community? Firstly, I think that the search for talent uh, on the editorial side, on, on, on um, uh, the uh, reviewer side, on, for authors, will, will propel increased competition. And publishers that have deep ties to the community and a reciprocal loyalty back 
will have a natural advantage here. That sounds to me like society publishing. We're also going to need to understand our end user customers and work more closely with them in a more holistic way. In particular, to understand what role they are consulting our resources for today and how they're reacting to us. Or I'm thinking in many cases, our scholars are also students, are also teachers, are active researchers, uh, in many cases are reviewers, and we don't know, and we have poor tools in managing the sort of many hats they wear and the relationships as they work with us. Uh, our identity as organizations will also have to become more global. When I, uh, one of my first uh, uh, international trips with ACS when I joined five years ago, I was meeting with um, uh, some libraries in France and talking about growth opportunities, and they said, well, you have a lot of possibilities, but you have two challenges. One is American, and the other is chemical, uh, in terms of looking at our growth. And I think societies overall have tended to be sort of bounded by uh, either um, uh, their disciplines or their, um, their, their locations, uh, more so than commercial publishers. All this is going to bring a shift in the emphasis in engaging the end user community. Um, it means that publishers are going to have to build muscle memory in understanding how uh, they interact with customers and how to deliver valuable value at the multiple touch points. Um, the key to this is frequency. And again, I think this is an area where society publishers have a real benefit because they are already dealing with uh, scholars, with students, with researchers uh, in their roles as editors and reviewers and authors. However, um, it, I think from a system side, this is going to be a challenge. And this is something that publishers haven't done well. Uh, a lot of information is locked up in different silos. Uh, you know, at ACS, for example, the customer numbers we use are completely different and a completely different system than the customer uh, uh, numbers that our um, uh, CAS uh, affiliate um, uses. So in many cases, it's very difficult for uh, us to be able to understand uh, what the total spend with an organization is, for example, or how, an or how a user is interacting with both systems. Um, the cost of managing these types of systems changes is going to be large, uh, but it's also going to require, I think, an even larger culture change, as well as technical skill to manage. So how do societies prepare uh, for the new information economy? Uh, well, the first thing, of course, is societies must and have, by a large uh, uh, point, uh, crossed the digital divide. Uh, they need to go global. They need to improve technology and shared services, offer uh, increased collaboration, increase their outreach and education, uh, and uh, use that to develop more integrated and improved customer knowledge. Uh, at AC ACS, we've had seen a tremendous um, uh, increase in our global reach uh, through our digitization program. In 2007, we declared the um, uh, online article, the article of record, uh, and that, and really restructured our business around that. We invested both in double digit, um, or in, in digital first production methodology to speed time to market, as well as lower operating costs, and launched a new digital delivery system that set the standard in the industry. We shifted our pricing and product offerings to reflect this move to online accessibility and decreased cost per title. As a result, our customer base has increased 30%, and most libraries uh, now subscribe to two to three times the amount of content that they did previously. By 2012, our relatively small collection of 44 titles have generated over 80 million counter downloads. Uh, perhaps more impressively, uh, the high quality and widespread accessibility of our journals uh, drives 1.6 um, uh, million citations a year, which leads the chemistry category. We are a global publisher. Uh, again, this is an area which I think that will be an interesting um, transition point for societies. Our membership is 80% North American, 20% international. Our author base, our usage uh, splits out much more, 30% to 40% US, and the rest split almost equally now between Europe and Asia. Technology improvement uh, from platform enhancements to back office, office systems, I think is um, uh, a significant step in realizing the next stage in publishing. Uh, and then ultimately, integrating your content and uh, uh, customer repositories, especially across the multiple silos that exist in a publishing uh, market. So at ACS, 
you see um, the four divisions we have, and you see in bold the, um, uh, the areas which we would typically call our publishing assets. But if you look at um, uh, across the page, there's a tremendous amount of content that is not integrated into any delivery or discovery system that we should be looking at. Um, I think, again, one of the biggest challenges we're going to find in the most immediate future is the fact that most of our authors really don't understand and have really not been following to the same degree that library and publishing communities have a lot of the debates around open access and new publishing models. And it's going to require a fair amount of education uh, and stimulus to do so. Um, overall, as a publisher, we've been testing uh, um, uh, methodologies for the last six or seven years. So initially we uh, launched in 2006 our articles and requests program which gave every author that publishes with ACS 50 downloads through um, uh, author directed links. Our member access program gives 168,000 members uh, 25 additional accesses as part of their membership. These are millions of dollars of additional unsubscribed access open to the community. Um, We've just launched four new programs around author choice, which is essentially a paid uh, author pays model, uh, both in, in immediate as well as uh, 12 month. We've also offered a ACS certified deposit that was, is aimed at um, relieving the author and the library of a lot of the administrative overhead of tracking uh, submission and compliance with funder mandates. Perhaps most importantly though, we are launching a full um, uh, or pure open access journal ACS uh, Central Science with no author or subscription fees, as well as introducing ACS Author Awards. This is a $60 million stimulus to the uh, open access market, so certainly in the, in, in the sciences, where we will offer every author that publishes with ACS in the next year a $1,500 credit towards any uh, purchase of any other uh, publishing service over the next three years. So this is a way that helps um, uh, current researchers with current budgets that were not aware of cre uh, the encroaching uh, funder mandates to have a transition plan from uh, the traditional publishing model to a, a pure open access. I think that's uh, my time, so thank you. Well, Bob invoked the 300 year plus history of learned societies, and I'm not gonna go back that far, but my tribute to history will be to speak only from a text and without PowerPoint. But I will, I will go back more than 100 years and begin with a story from when the research university was still a new growth in the United States. William Rainey Harper, the first president of the nascent University of Chicago, was aggressive in recruiting star faculty to his new campus. He'd offer blandishments, including one relevant to our topic this morning. If Harper really wanted someone, the president would promise the wavering scholar that he, and it was almost always a he in those days, would be the editor of not one, but two new journals that the university press would publish. One, a journal for academic specialists, and the second for the general public. This strategy soon proved to be budgetarily unsustainable, but we can admire the twin goals of building both scholarly rigor and public enlightenment. Now, modern learned societies, um, the sort that I represent, emerged at the same moment as the new universities, and these two institutions together uh, shared the project of enacting the idea of research. This morning, I want to talk about learned societies in the humanities as they confront the changing climate of scholarly communication. Today, executive directors and presidents of humanities scholarly associations must ask themselves, to what question is open access the answer? To help understand their thinking, I'll provide a few general framing comments and can then consider how the issues bundled in the move to open access affect these societies. So first, what do we mean when we talk about learned societies in the humanities and interpretive social sciences? The ACLS has 71 members and they're a pretty diverse group. But to oversimplify, they roughly fall into three categories large disciplinary societies, interdisciplinary societies, and subdisciplinary societies. The disciplinary societies are what most people have in mind as the ideal type of learned society. About 15 of our 71 societies are in this category, including all the major social science uh, societies, but our largest member is the Modern Language Association with more than 28,000 members, followed by the American Historical Association, 15,000, and the American Anthropological Association, 11,000. 
but a disciplinary society can also be pretty small. The Linguistic Society of America has 4,800 members, the American Musicological Society, 2,000. Most disciplinary societies have a staff of anywhere from three to 30 full-time employees, and they maintain the flagship journals in their field. They take responsibility for setting scholarly standards in the name of their disciplines, and their meetings are the site of job markets in those areas. Then there are interdisciplinary societies, the best of which known of which are those in area studies, Latin American studies, Asian studies, African studies. But we also have temporal interdisciplinary societies, 18th century studies, 17th century studies. The larger of these do have a professional staff, but the smaller do not. Then there are, and this is probably more than half our membership and more than half the number of learned societies out there in the world, uh, smaller subdisciplinary societies. In our case, say, the International Center for Medieval Art, or the Society for French Historical Studies. They have membership in the hundreds, very thin staffing, and perhaps no paid staffing at all. Their executive director is a faculty member and may, who may get some modest course release, or is maybe doing it entirely on his or own, her own time. Yet all of these societies have journals, and most of them have editors and editorial boards. Um, now, all our societies, and I think all societies in the science as well, are essentially voluntary associations. They're voluntary in the sense of who does most of the work on committees and councils, and they are voluntary in the very nature of membership. You don't have to join. You can be quite distinguished historian and never go to a meeting of the AHA. Yet societies attract members because they provide a vital horizontal linkage across institutions. Members are united by common interests, Learned societies were formed as social networks before the term was coined. And they have democratic governance, a chief elective officer, a president who governs with an elected council. Uh, but these officers are elected, by and large, for their scholarly achievement and eminence, and not for their business acumen or their familiarity with the dynamics of scholarly communication. Now, most of our societies, both large and small, have roughly the same business model a three-legged stool of membership dues, conference registration, including, and uh, conference revenues, including exhibition fees, and publications. Publications are mostly journals, although some have monographs, most of which lose money, and some have reference works, which make money. They also feel them, they all, almost all our societies feel themselves to be extremely fragile financially. They live close to the margin of their operating income. Only a few have modest reserves or endowments, and rarely more than a million dollars. Now, each leg of the stool of this business model is very uncertain now. Societies worry about membership in relation to the changing demographics of faculty and the declining portion of the teaching force on the tenure track. They worry about conferences and meetings with the vagaries of airline fares, the, ze the zeal for reducing everyone's carbon footprint and not fly about, and the decline in university budgets for travel. I don't have to explain to this audience why publication revenues are unpredictable. All societies are looking for new means of revenue and new means of strengthening the basic value proposition they present to potential members. I know Kathleen will have more to say on that point. Scholarly societies are all about peer review in the broadest sense. They were created to name and claim an area of knowledge and to establish and monitor standards for cultivating that area. Establishing a peer review journal was the most obvious way of doing that, but there are many other ways, prizes for books and articles, and even the elections of officers themselves. Most humanities journals have two types of peer review, pre-publication review of research articles and post-publication review of books and other published materials. That's a very essential part of their mission because post-publication peer review counts tremendously in subsequent stages of peer review, such as tenure cases and funding competitions. Now, most society publications make money, but not a lot. A recent study of eight journals in the humanities found that in 2007, they had about $6.9 million in costs and $8.4 million in revenue. So that would come to less than $200,000 per journal if all the costs and revenues were distributed equally. Subscriptions, I can't say this clearly enough, to journals in the humanities and interpretive social sciences are cheap. The price of institutional subscriptions to both the online and print editions of the American Historical Review varies from $365 to $730, depending on the institution's size and research productivity. American anthropologists cost $550 a year. 
PMLA is priced at $210 a year. The transactions of the American Philological Association can be had for $175 a year. Subscription revenues from institutions and individuals roughly equal the cost of production, so the surplus revenue comes largely from advertising and royalties. Most of the surplus goes, almost all the surplus goes back to societies, and the degree to which you think of learned societies as part of the academic uh, enterprise, this may be thought as uh, money that the scholarly system pays itself. Given the limited size of most scholarly uh, society budgets, these modest revenues are essential. This is the framework within which learned society leadership considers the proposition I mentioned earlier. To what question is open access to humanities journal the answer? Is it the answer to strains on library budgets? As I noted earlier, humanities journals are cheap. They are what the Harvard librarian describes as sustainably priced. I would suggest that it takes a fairly absolutist, even Manichaean lens to suggest that any price is a predatory price. Is open access the answer to how a learned society accomplishes its mission? It can be. Promoting humanistic knowledge as a vital component of a healthy society, broad society, is uh, an in integral to their being, but only if the society still has the means to accomplish that after instituting open access. All of our members are experimenting with different adaptations. The Latin American Studies Association, for example, has made its uh, publications free to IP dresses based in Latin America. Some societies are experimenting with an open access regime of some journals while maintaining subscription revenues for others. More and more, they are adopting some version of green open access, allowing authors to retain rights and post their work on their own website or institutional repositories. Could gold open access, the author pays model, work in the humanities? It could if we had more gold, but I'm here to tell you that we don't. The boom, uh, uh, Brandon just mentioned the sciences has passed us by. ACLS funds a lot of scholarship. We award $15 million in fellowship and grants, but if re recipients of our fellowships use stipends to pay author fees, they would be trading publication costs for research time. The National Endowment for Humanities, its funding is now 29% of its peak appropriation, an additional 49% cut has been proposed, and the House Budget Committee is considering complete elimination of all funding. Um, if the author pays model were widely adopted in the humanities, it would increase the already problematical level of inequality in academia. Wealthy universities could pay for their faculty, but scholars at public universities and smaller colleges could not expect such largesse. <clears throat> so to conclude, can learned societies in the humanities pull off William Rainey Harper's trick? Can they have the means to identify, celebrate, and publish scholarly excellence while also promoting the broadest circulation of new knowledge? I'm optimistic they will, but there will be more experimentation and adaptation. Let's hope they do, for with their open membership and democratic governance, learned societies provide one of the most powerful solvents for the growing stratification of higher education. Thank you. Sorry, this is just going to take me a second. Oh, PowerPoint let go. Okay. Play, please. Um, theoretically, no, uh, assuming that the slides, there we go, uh, except no, it's playing in the wrong place. Hang on. Sorry, it's playing on my computer instead of... So I just need to, yeah, it's, it, it should be unmirrored. To, oh, but I, I, I'm supposed to be using a presenter's display is the problem. Enable presenter's display is enabled. 
should not be, oh wait, there's the arrangement. Do not mirror. There we go. Okay. Ta-da, <laughs> fabulous. Sorry for the delay. It wouldn't be technology if it always worked. Um, so uh, you're going to hear a lot of echoes in, in what I have to say today um, of, of Steve's remarks, um, which perhaps should not be surprising. I am the director of scholarly communication of the Modern Language Association, which um, I have just found out recently is actually the largest, if you think of scholarly societies as distinct from professional organizations, we are the largest scholarly society in the world. Um, the MLA, as you might imagine, is, is popularly seen as a pretty conservative organization. Um, and insofar as that's true, it's for pretty good reasons. Um, the association's mandate over the last 130 years has included furthering the values of careful, deliberative, scholarly thought in a culture that often seems to prize speed and under-considered notions of progress above all else. Um, on the other hand, as Abby Clowbridge recently noted in her review of the National Academy of Sciences public comment meeting on public access to federally funded research, the Modern Language Association was the lone publisher to offer full support for a new model for scholarly communication. Now, how did we at the MLA come to this position? Um, and how are we working strategically to imagine the future of our publishing and communication activities? I'm happy to have the opportunity to share with you today some of our thinking on these issues. Um, since the Royal Society of London is a slightly different version of the histories that we have heard of these organizations, um, learned and professional societies <clears throat> excuse me, have been created precisely in order to help facilitate communication amongst member scholars and between those members and the broader intellectual world. Now, early on, that communication took place via meetings and letters that were sent among the membership between meetings. Over time, the meetings developed into regularly scheduled conferences, and the letters were gathered into systematically produced and distributed journals. Those journals accrued a series of formal publishing processes, including, of course, editing and peer review, that came to mark them as authoritative resources for developing knowledge in their fields. And those resources came not only to be valued by their original audience, the members of the society, but also by a broader range of scholars, researchers, and students. And as a result, research libraries collected those journals and made them available to their patrons. Now this was, by and large, a system that worked. Um, scholars joined societies in order to gain access to the resources and conversations that those societies made available. And societies were supported in their work, not only by those members, but also by libraries, whose subscriptions extended the reach of those resources. The funds that were generated through membership dues and subscriptions enabled the societies not only to fulfill their mission of facilitating scholarly communication, but also to do other kinds of work on behalf of their memberships, including advocating for the field within institutions and on the national and international scene, supporting members in developing professional practices and standards, and so on. Joining such a society was what professionals did, and scholarly communication was what scholarly societies were for. Now, things have changed over the last several decades, however, and the development of new technologies for communication is only one of those changes. Scholars' professional lives have become increasingly precarious as employment conditions in colleges and universities have dramatically weakened. As a result, an increasing number of scholars is unable or unwilling to commit the ongoing resources to professional societies that they feel cannot sufficiently assist in meeting their core needs. University and research libraries' budgets have been strained by the need to maintain often exorbitant subscriptions to journals sold by commercial publishers. As a result, those libraries are decreasingly willing to and able to help support the not-for-profit societies to which the scholars at their institutions belong. Societies find themselves straining under declining membership levels, increasing publishing costs, and diminishing subscription revenue. As a result, many societies have turned to commercial publishers as a means of sustaining their communication programs and supporting their other functions. But those publishers, of course, have a very different sense of mission from the scholars, libraries, and societies among which they mediate. 
Now, into this already complex set of competing interests and needs enter the internet, and in particular, the World Wide Web. The web was, like scholarly societies, invented for the express purpose of supporting communication amongst researchers by allowing them to create pages on which they can share their work with one another and with the world. The difference, of course, is that the web permits any individual scholar with server access and a little bit of technical knowledge to share their work directly and immediately, further diminishing their apparent need for those collectives that scholarly societies have have historically provided. As a result of these tensions, recent discussions about open access have been beset by misunderstandings, some intentional and some unintentional. Many scholars fear that open access will result in a chaos of self-publishing without any peer review, despite the fact that open access is perfectly compatible with peer review and that new modes of review for openly published work are being developed. Many societies argue that open access is financially unsustainable and that it will destroy the business models on which they have relied, when in fact a range of new models for open access publishing are coming into being. On the other hand, many people believe that open access publishing can be done for free. While it's true that the costs of reproduction for scholarship online trend toward zero, significant costs of production remain. As a result, arguments around open access and the future of scholarly communication tend to wind up in a stalemate of sorts, with the various constituencies involved talking past rather than with one another. Now, we at the MLA strongly believe that this need not be so. Right? We all, scholars, libraries, societies, and the broader public, share the goal of increasing the wealth of knowledge that we hold in common. And if we focus on that collective goal, a viable path might be for, uh, carved out. Now, there is still reason for some benefits of membership in a scholarly society to be exclusive to the society's members. There is still value provided in the editorial work done by a scholarly society in producing authoritative research records. But like scholars and libraries, societies must begin to grapple with the shifts in value that have been created in and around the internet. All of the changes in the profession that I discussed earlier, including the casualization of academic labor and the severe constraints imposed on library budgets, require us to contemplate the possibility that the locus of a society's value proposition in the process of knowledge creation may be moving from selling access to certain research products to instead facilitating the broadly open distribution of the work done by its members. Now, this is a profound shift, and not just for societies, but for their members. The scholarly society may, in coming years, operate on, under a model in which, rather than becoming a member in order to get access to the society's products, one instead becomes a member in order to get one's own work out to the world, surrounded by and associated with the other work done by experts in the field. Now, the value of joining a scholarly society in the age of open, public, web-based communication, then, may be in the ability to participate in that communication. And for that reason, we at the MLA have recently launched MLA Commons, um, which is a platform on which our members can collaborate with one another, can participate in group discussions, and can share their work openly and freely with the world. The platform is also enabling us to consider new ways of using our more formal publications to better fulfill our mission, making as much of our work as freely available as possible while still providing for the organization's future sustainability. With that goal in mind, we've recently moved our journal profession onto the Commons, where it is open to any interested reader, though membership is required in order to respond. We want to work with our members in the coming years to develop a new set of structures, new professional practices, and new standards that work with such open, publicly accessible communication, including new forms of editing and new forms of peer review. And we are committed to the idea that the role of the scholarly society in the years ahead will be to support those new practices, to promote the work that's being done by our members, and to help create the broadest possible public understanding of the importance of that work for our collective future. Thank you.
<laughs> okay, now, what about some questions, people? This is a, you've all spoken, yes, you've all spoken, amazing. So, um, any questions now from tweeting? Any tweeting questions? Okay, ah, I see a question moving forward, I think. Hello, question moving forward. Say who you are, please. Melissa Belvati from the University of Prince Edward Island. And I have a question for Brandon. Um, you mentioned wanting to break down silos, and I hope that also includes budget silos. And then I was really impressed with your company's concept of the author rewards, and I was wondering what you would think of the allowing the um, authors to donate those rewards to their respective institutional library to defray the costs of the library, um, supporting their research? Yes. Yes. Lot of excitement from librarians on the front row there. The mic is not on. It is on. Isn't the light it? is on, and there we go. It just takes a while to warm up. Okay, so yes, that's a very interesting concept. Uh, you know, the challenge is just initially is one of scale. Um, is we have uh, uh, forty thousand authors a year uh, that would qualify for this in the first implementation, and we're still, quite frankly, working on the software and backend systems to support that. The goal, though, is that these will be transferable uh, to. Uh, we had originated uh, had had thought it between uh, different uh, to, to scholars. So a scholar could reward it to somebody else on their work, their work team, award it to somebody else at the university uh, over the course of the three years that this program will run. So we already have a, a degree of transferability uh, that would be really up to the scholar to decide where they um, uh, uh, offer that. The question from down here while Brandon's thinking about that was not to their library question mark. Okay. Uh, as I, we hadn't thought about, I, I, I could absolutely see how that would work, uh, but I haven't thought exactly how I would accomplish that. There we are, we have a winning suggestion. Next, uh, any questions, oh. anything? Oh, you've had that question. Uh, anybody from Gold? We have a question in Gold. Please go ahead, Gold. Uh, Sandy Thatcher again. Uh, I just want to- You moved, Sandy, that's moved. fair. Um, I'm chairing a session, a uh, lively luncheon today, which is going to talk about societies as publishers more, and Kathleen will be on that panel too. But my question right now to this panel is the importance of size in determining whether a society wants to go it on its own as a publisher or not. I note that the ACS, because it's a large publisher, does its own publishing. On our panel, we will have a representative of the American Psychological Association, which also does its own publishing. But there are other ones that are large, like American Political Science, which uses Cambridge. Uh, we know what the history of the American Anthropological Association, which so, started, Sorry to be a nuisance, which, Sandy, but I think uh, they've got the question now. So let, can we just go on with the question? The, 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 the question is, is there any study that anyone knows of that talks about what level of size a society has to be in order to be able to sustain its own publishing program? This is Steve Wheatley, Sandy. Um, I don't know of any, <clears throat> of, of any study, but I can tell you impressionistically that the um, uh, size does not absolutely correlate with, with self-publishing or, or publishing with, with a uh, commercial or other publisher. Some of our smaller societies, the Society for the Advancement of Scandinavian Studies, publishes on its own. So does the American Association for Baltic Studies. Um, but it, it is an important question because as publishing becomes more complicated, more technologically intensive, there are more options. It probably quickly, pretty quickly outruns what a smaller society can do. Thank you. Um, anybody, anybody else, any comments on that one? I would just quickly say, as a publisher, in the past, who published for lots and lots of learned societies, there came a time when it became not possible to do any partnership with societies which were too small. So, okay, if you're working on a basis like Bio One, you can perhaps do that, but you can't if you're a commercial publisher, and I include the ACS in this, okay? So, any other questions from upstairs? I have a question from the uh, Colonial Room. This is Ben Wagner from the University of Buffalo. The panel alluded to the uh, huge increase, particularly in the sciences, of the number of 
pages published, number of articles, number of new journals that just been astounding. My question is, is that do vendors really understand that this is completely unsustainable, that, that our library budgets at best are flat, and, and is there a plan, some of them perhaps was alluded to, but is there a plan for the fact that we're on an unsustainable growth just from the sheer number of journals being, and articles being published? Uh, I guess the, the microphone's being handed to me to answer that one. Uh, this is Brandon Nordine for those in the uh, remote locations. Um, I, I think the, you know, the, the challenge is we're all part of an ecosystem. The vast majority of these papers that are being authored are coming out of universities. Um, and so I, I think there's, you know, there's, there's a, a circular wheel here where we have um, more papers being authored, more uh, um, pressure to publish. We have an increased emphasis on undergraduate publication. And as a scholarly society, our goal is to help advance the sciences. And so I think you know, we're trying to balance, and certainly we look at our, you, uh, we see, see our articles uh, count has risen, but so has our rigor, so has essentially our selectivity of those journals. The challenge is trying to meet the needs of both the increase in output and also the rapid evolutions of science or the splintering of, of the disciplines and interdisciplinary studies. There are whole topics that five, 10 years ago were just not on the table as publishable areas. So I think that's another challenge, especially in the science. I would just add that, you know, obviously in the age of the internet, we are seeing an, in, an uh, exponential increase in the flow of material that's being posted openly on the web in addition to things that are being published through traditional venues. I think increasingly um, what we're going to need, um, rather than sort of attempting to stem that tide or somehow make it more into a manageably um, regulated flow, to think about how we're using scholarly societies, and I'll talk some more about this during that lively lunch, um, uh, how scholarly societies might help provide means of filtering for their members the, the enormous overflow of content um, that is out there in a way that helps researchers find the stuff that they're looking for and that they need to be in contact with at the moment that they need to be in contact with it. This doesn't obviously speak to, to your question about library budgets, but increasingly we think that, that you know, where, where resources are becoming strained for scholars in the age of the internet, it's in time and attention um, to be able to keep up with this enormous overflow of material that's being produced. Okay, um, the gentleman at the back in the Carolina, please. Hello, uh, Todd Kelly again, Vice President at Carthage College. Uh, um, can people hear Professor Kelly? Try, is it switched on? It's on. Hello. Can anybody hear? I can, we can hear him in gold. Hello, so, okay. So uh, 20 years after the creation of Project Muse, my question is, why are we still uh, putting out all these print uh, journals? And I would like each of you to explain uh, what your plan is for the devolution of print uh, publication. That, which one's first there? <laughs> Stephen. Uh, <clears throat> Our societies would tell you that there's a great demand for print among their members. Um, and that the, as, Receiving the journal is still a member benefit that they need to consider that. Um, certainly in terms of circulation through the system generally, it's an online phenomenon, but there is a, great dem there is a remaining demand for print. I, I can only say yes, that's absolutely true. Um, if you ask our members, they want that print object still, by and large. The vast majority do. Um, so we, we have a plan. I mean, obviously, we're moving everything digitally as well. Um, but uh, we, we really do need to do what it is our members, who are our primary audience, are requesting of us and keep that print object in production. OK, this is, I guess, where uh, we're on the uh, other side of the teeter-totter here. Um, ACS, as I mentioned earlier, uh, declared the online article the, object, uh, the article of record in 2007. Uh, in 2009, we moved to a, um, uh, essentially a two-up, sort of condensed and rotated print format in recognition that uh, of the declining number of libraries that were asking for print. We keep print alive as a service to the libraries and the scholars that want it. Uh, but currently, aside from uh, our news magazine, CNDN, 
and uh, the Journal of Chemical Education, which goes to a, a different demographic, um, we have fewer than uh, 200 uh, copies per um, uh, journal uh, that uh, are subscribed to in print. So fundamentally for us, it's a vestigial object. Okay, another question from the... We have a uh, question uh, Rachel from Rachel Fleming has had condensed some tweets for you. Go on, tweet. Um, uh, just shortly, uh, in the new model that Kathleen describes, are members joining and using the society to publish for other members or for the public? And what impact does that have? I would say that, that members are using MLA Commons for both of those purposes. Um, they're, they're in direct communication with one another on particular projects that they're working on. They're collaborating. They're, they're, they're communicating quite um, robustly with one another, but they're also recognizing that the platform provides a really extraordinary opportunity to get their work out directly to a broader set of publics um, that they can reach through this platform. Um, so both of those things um, are happening. We have in the works a plan to expand the commons um, in a way that will allow it to connect with other such scholarly commonses. So as other scholarly societies create similar sorts of structures for their members, we would be able then to collaborate across those society lines and really foster extraordinary interdisciplinary work, particularly where our memberships are overlapping, as Steve talked about, um, with some of the interdisciplinary and, and smaller societies. So we're, we're working toward a larger model in which this commons might facilitate a really robust robustly networked set of d discussions in which the public might be able to see the value of what it is we do in the humanities. Um, what Kathleen's talking about is really a great idea, and the MLA Commons can become the House of Commons. <laughs> now, another question from Caroline, and then I'll go upstairs. Professor Holly. Okay. Yes, yes, um, Bob Holly. The microphone is yours. Uh, for a short time. Okay. Bob Holley, School of Library and Information Science, Wayne State University. One of the ideas that has come up at prior Charleston conferences is to find some way of vetting monographs that are so niche topics that while the scholarship is excellent, they're not commercially viable. Do you think that that would be possible by the scholarly societies and the humanities at a cost that would be reasonable enough for the author or the institution to pay it and that would be strong enough that tenure and promotion committees would accept the vetting as an indication of the quality of the scholarship? Uh -huh. I think the second half of that proposition is where the challenge lies. I think the, the cost model on having societies handle such, um, uh, such vetting is entirely manageable. I think we can find a way to do that work. But ensuring that the faculty themselves take such a model seriously by ensuring that their institutions take it seriously is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, so we're, we're um, thinking at the MLA about the ways that we as a society might advocate for different kinds of approaches to the evaluation of scholarship for tenure and promotion, um, recognizing that the imprimatur of the, of the university press, while it is extraordinarily important and has been in the life of scholarship um, for, for decades, decades, um, is not the only marker of quality that we have available to us when we look at scholarship online, that we might actually be able to, to, to know more through alternative metrics and um, through open discussions of scholarship available digitally um, about how that work is actually being used and the kinds of impact that it's having on its community. Um, it's going to take a whole lot of advocacy to get universities to take that as a, a primary marker um, in the tenure and promotion process, but I think that's definitely where we've got to head. Okay, thank you. The time is up, I'm afraid, Colonial and Gold, and tweeters, Twitters rather, tweeters, sorry, <laughs> and tweeters. Um, okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, panel.